Good afternoon. This is Dr. Dan Guerra coming to you from Veramed Studios in the Inland Pacific Northwest. Today we're going to talk about a topic that's related to a drug, peptide drug, that is used to alter um, intermediary signal transduction pathways that ultimately lead to the production of mitochondria. And the reason this drug seems to have efficacy is it because it immediately affects the way that glucose and lipid metabolism are mediated in certain cardiovascular tissues that may have been negatively impacted by obesity-linked diabetes. So this drug is uh, something new that's been on the market. Um, it is a peptide, so it's going to be kind of costly. We're going to take a look at its mode of action sort of indirectly by looking at a paper published very recently, just um, in fact this month, January 2019, in the Biochem Biophys Research uh, Act uh, BB, um, Communications. So let's get started with that right now. Okay, first of all, let's do a slideshow. Yeah, okay, so there I am. Uh, I'm Dr. Daniel Guerra. I am the uh, co-founder and the chief scientific officer president of Verev Med. Verev Med, we are a company that works online to help you interpret the scientific literature, the published, refereed, vetted scientific literature, bringing you the evidence, verifying the evidence against the background of other epistemological aspects of the research embedded in an understanding of genetics, biochemistry, that's my forte, uh, pharmacology, my colleagues forte, as well as in uh, other aspects of physiology um, and epigenetics. So I'm not going to talk about Verevmed today. I am going to re-pilot a uh, talk on Verevmed and how it could be useful to you. But right now I'm going to deliver to you yet another one of my free video lectures. So if you've seen me before, you know what I'm going to do. Let's get started. I'm going to talk to you today about drug targeting, diabetic cardiovascular dysfunction with a diabetological implication. Diabetology is something that I've developed as a new scientific paradigm. You can find that in my previous talks. They're all on uh, my Facebook page. You can find them there. And I am indeed still trying to catalog them. And boy, could I use some volunteer help to do that. The subtitle of the talk is Mitochondrial Biogenesis is a Telos to Improve Endothelial Vascular Physiology. That's the exact date today, the 3rd of January. Again, that's me. Let's get started. Okay, the paper is, again, a BBRC communication coming out. Actually, it's not quite out yet. It'll, it'll be in a few weeks, 22nd of January. And this is what the paper basically is going to discuss. Endothelial mitochondria are essential for ATP synthesis via primary metabolism. Glycolysis, fatty acid beta oxidation, linked to the TCA cycle, and the electron transport chain oxidative phosphorylation are, of course, primary metabolism where all occur within the mitochondria, of course, except glycolysis, which is cytosolic, hence the interest in mitochondria. Vascular disease associated with mitochondrial dysfunction, very common, corrupts endothelial homeostasis, and that can lead to such terrible diseases as atherosclerosis, hypertension, and of course, coronary artery disease. Mitochondrial biogenesis promotes homeostasis, and this requires mitochondrial DNA replication prior to fission. You know the mitochondria of DNA as well as, of course, the nucleus. Both genomes have to be expressed in coordinated fashion in order for the cell to function in eukaryotes. So you have both nuclear and mitochondrial genes. They both have to be involved and they have to be coordinately expressed. Okay, that's going to be part of the paper. That's why I'm bringing that up. I'm sure most of you are aware of this. Mitochondrial biogenesis is regulated by a transcription factor. Um, one of the most significant ones is peroxisome proliferation activated receptor gamma co-activator. Isn't that a wonderful title? Um, one alpha, in fact, only one isoform of it. So we just call that, I hope you find this convenient as well, PGC1 alpha. PGC1 alpha then stimulates nuclear respiratory factor NRF1 and something called transcription factor A mitochondrial, or TFAM. I hate the fact that last word's an adjective. I don't know why they did that, but it's really what it's called. Uh, anyways, which subsequently arbitrate 
mitochondrial DNA transcription. Okay, those are the uh, transcription factors which are required for mitochondrial DNA transcription, which is all linked to a protein synthesized from the nuclear genome in the cytosol called PGC1 alpha, which enters into the mitochondria. Now, <clears throat> Reduced activity of PGC1 alpha leads to atherosclerosis. So stimulation and maintenance of the PGC1 alpha NRF I T NRF1 TFAM pathway, that sequence pathway, via pharmacology could medically improve vasculature related diseases. Okay, so this is the introduction to this paper. There's the peptide up there that we're going to be looking at. It's called lixicenatide or elixisenatide. It's a synthetic peptide. You can see it there. And it's basically a pharmacological agonist of a receptor called the glucon-like peptide 1 receptor. Now, don't worry about that. I'm going to explain to it in enough detail that you'll get why this works this way. That is the actual pharmacology of the drug mode of action. When it binds to that receptor, it stimulates pancreatic insulin release thus uh, plus inhibiting glucagon secretion in response to increased blood glucose. So this is actually some of the downstream effectors for insulin secretion, right? And lixacenatide is a synthetic pep peptide seen there, synthesized from pharma pharmacological company that is used to target uh, via agonist, agonist approach to that receptor thus linking this directly to insulin secretion and simultaneously shutting off glucagon secretion, therefore controlling glucose homeostasis. So lixicenatide is an anti-atherosclerotic, which means it's, there's a reduction in the antheroma, atheroma plaque size. And it also enhances, another thing that this drug seems to do, M2 macrophage phenotype. And that basically is a suppressor of local inflammation, local endothelial inflammation in this context of this paper and of this disease paradigm. So lixicenatide has been reported to antagonize, these are some of the things it's been shown to do in the literature, cerebral ischemia, reperfusion injury, and it also improves endothelial function by upregulating the expression of endothelial nitric oxide synthase and vascular endothelial growth factor VEGF. So those are all positive things that this drug seems to have an impact on. So lixicenatide increases, here's some of the ways it works, intracellular cyclic AMP and the response element binding, that is CREB, which actually responds to the cyclic AMP, generated from adenylate cyclase upon a single transduction cascade. CREB, right, that transcription factor, induces transcription of the PGC1 alpha protein that we're interested in. So lixicenatide might play a role in regulating PGC1 alpha signaling and therefore mitochondrial biogenesis. So it seems to fit in speculation at this point. Now, this comes from a slide from a previous talk I gave on the Barrett Med Studio network. Um, You've got uh, in a system of exercise where the um, intramuscular triacylglycerols generate free fatty acids. Free fatty acids induce something called PPAR, that is a proxisomal proliferator activator receptor protein, which functions in the nucleus. Along with that happening, glycogen levels decrease. So you're utilizing fatty acids. This, don't worry, this is all going to be linked together during activity. This is linked, of course, to cardiovascular tone, right? Glycogen levels tend to decrease, of course, during muscular activity. And that regulates a series of other proteins like P38 and AMP kinase. Now, P38 will directly enhance PGC1, okay? It'll, it'll, AMP kinase will also cause the expression of PGC1 and also mediate the expression of P53. All of that leads to the NRF dimerizing, binding to a, uh, to a cis-acting element in the DNA of the muscle, this is in the musculature, inducing the further expression of PGC1 alpha and several other proteins, notable CD36, which allows for the uptake of free fatty acids from the plasma, 
see there, CD36, so-called orphan receptor for fatty acid utilization. So you don't just use intramuscular triglycerols during prolonged exercise, you also bring fatty acids in. That means that you're limiting glucose as the only fuel you're starting to use fatty acids. It's a good thing for the muscle. Okay. But not only that, <clears throat> you also produce the cyclooxygenase subunit. So you're producing eicosanoids, oxygenated fatty acids, some of which can be pro-inflammatory. Okay. Uh, and of course, some of them also can be vasoconstricting and vasodilating. This is one of the reasons that these are produced upon this high level of endured muscular activity. Something I'm not going to talk about today, but for those of you that have seen other talks where I've discussed eicosanoids, 20 carbon oxygenated fatty acids, you know where this is linked in. So, what about this AMP kinase? AMP kinase, okay, epigenetically enhances mitochondrial genesis. Phosphorylation of a key DNA methyl transferase, histone acetyltransferase, and coactivator of histone acetyltransferase. Okay? Therefore, that promotes the formation of new mitochondria. So, AMP kinase can work both at the level of signal transduction, just via phosphorylation of intermediate proteins, thus regulating transcriptional activation of yet nascent. Uh, transcriptional activators like PGC1-alpha, enhancing mitochondrial genesis full stop, as we'll see, because of downstream expression of proteins, such as citrate synthase and a component of the electron transport chain, but also epigenetically by altering phosphorylation of key epigenetic enzyme components, the methyltransferase and the HAT enzyme. These, in turn, will alter the DNA by methylation and acetylation, thus regulating epigenetically the profile of what genes get expressed in the tissue. So I will bring this up because epigenetics will be discussed at the end as well. I'm not going to spend much time on this afternoon for this talk, though. So this is a lot more complicated. It comes from the science signaling paper I also covered a while back. This was uh, 2017, so I probably covered it in 2017. But these are just some of the proteins involved in epigenetics. This is a methyltransferase. This is a, a protein called RBB, where there is an AMP kinase phosphorylation site. It has a WD40 domain. Uh, it is conserved between human, rat, and mouse. These are all proteins, okay, whose genes are regulated by this epigenetic pathway linked to AMP kinase, as you can see here. AMP kinase shuts off the, methyl, uh, the DNA methyltransferase. That's the, that's the enzyme that removes uh, the methyl group. And because of that, it alters this ratio of activity of methylation and acetylation. Ultimately, AMP kinase, the strong dark arrows, cause promoter modification of these genes, the ones that we're keying in on today. PGC1-alpha, the NRF that I've already mentioned, the nuclear factor, TFAM, and uh, this UCP, which is the uncoupling protein, which actually allows for heat generation because of mitochondrial membrane opening via fatty acid utilization. Okay, so you get heat dissipation rather than electron transport. Those are all important genes to regulate and modify mitochondrial respiration. And what they also are involved in because they're synthesized is mitochondrial biogenesis and of course positive function. Don't need to worry about the fact that the expression of these genes are regulated by cyclic AMP, but they are. I'm just showing you where it links in. Right, now let's go back to a clinical aspect. What I do in these talks, I do biochemistry, I get thick into the molecularity, then I pull out, I talk about diseases and clinical aspects. And I try to keep it steadily moving and in a good positive affect so that we see how the paper I'm discussing today links in at the level of the dialectic uh, with all the other uh, papers that have been published in this area, at least the ones that seem relevant, both ones that are negative and positive, actually, because I look at both sides. Back to the disease. Diabetes is a worldwide epidemic, probably affects 350 million people. This is a World uh, Health Organization estimate. Almost 80% of type 2 diabetic, it's not type 1, it's independent, are overweight or obese. So that means there's some linkage there. We know why. We have really good understanding of the etiology of disease, the progression of disease, and the final outcomes of it, which can lead to early death, and certainly a lot of morbidity throughout life. Talked about it many times in previous Vera Fed lectures. You can find them on my Facebook, as I said. 
Uh, you can also just probe YouTube and use my name and Vera Medna Fineman. Since hyperglycemia is a primary cause of diabetic complications, I wouldn't say it's a cause so much as it's correlated, but I use the word cause because that's what's in the literature. And it accounts for the majority of economic costs associated with diabetic therapeutic approaches. We're focused on regulating glucose levels and hepatic glucose production, or GP. Now, that's important to understand this paper. A drug called metformin, <clears throat> which is very widely used, prescribed type, type 2 diabetic drug, uh, works through the reduction in glucose production. That's what it does. It inhibits gluconeogenesis. That's what glucose production is to a biochemist. Metformin has side effects, leading to the development of hypoglycemic agents aimed at increasing circulating levels of action of gut-derived incretins. These are hormones generated in the gut, such as dipeptidopeptidase 4 or DPP4 inhibitors, and glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor, or GLP1R agonists. Okay, and that's what we're looking at today. A couple of the ones that have already been out there in the clinic are exenatide and liraglutide. Those are things, those are drugs that are actually prescribed for people with diabetes who are having problem with metformin. The only success of this overall treatment highlights the importance of a GI tract in regulating glucose homeostasis. I want you to keep that in mind. To understand the diaventological aspects of medicine and of science in the general, you need to know that there are changes in the effect of drugs and in metabolic pathways and gene expression that are related to time. So there's a temporal uh, element to all of this. And of course, to spatial affectivity, that is where it occurs. So when you look at where things happen, when genes are expressed, when metabolic pathways are altered, and look at different time intervals, you get sometimes 180 degree differential effects based on what you think a drug might do. Okay, so that's an event ontology. You're looking at an event, not a substance ontology. You're looking at things happening in dynamic mode, which is how life is. So we don't talk about substances in uh, Vera Med. We talk about events, event ontology. So, all right, now let's go through this pretty quickly. Again, this came from a previous talk. I just want you to once again think about this when I'm talking about the rest of the paper. The GI is anatomically positioned to prevent nutrient excess via negative feedback mechanisms through nutrient-induced secretion of GI hormones. Okay? What are those hormones? CCK, G1P, GLP1, that is the one that's going to link to the receptor we talked about. Maybe GLP2, we're not too sure yet about how that works. Uh, OXN and PBY, these are all peptides. Okay, That happens in the duodenum. In the jejunum, you get CCK and G1P. And in the ileum, you get GLP, GLP2, uh, OXN, and PYY, all in the small intestine. So this is the gut talking to the overall homeostatic control of nutrition in the body. Of course, this is going to be linked to obesity and to the cardiovascular disease and cancer associated with obesity and the metabolic diseases like diabetes type 2. The stomach isn't, isn't left out either. The stomach actually generates two adipokines, ghrelin and leptin, which I've also talked to at great length in previous talks. I'm not going to talk about them today. So in the stomach, ghrelin is an erixogenic peptide. It increase, with increases associated with the timing of a meal and intake of nutrients, it suppresses ghrelin. Uh, uh, the, what that does is suppress ghrelin secretion. Although ghrelin may act in an endocrine way, a vagotomy, which disrupts the communication between the stomach and the brain, because they do talk all the time, abolishes the ability of ghrelin to increase food intake, suggesting there's also a paracrine effect that's going through the vagus nerve. Ghrelin also regulates glucose homeostasis by increasing the gastric emptying rate and inhibiting glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. Okay? Small intestine contains a variety of signals like CCK, cholecystokinin, that's what CCK stands for, in eye cells and glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, or G1P, or GIP, excuse me, in so-called K cells of the intestine, and in the ileum and large intestine within the L cells. Glucagon-like peptides 1 and 2, that's GLP-1 and 2, that's what it's called, that's what it means, oxyntomodulin, or OXN, and just plain old peptide YY, all then secreted in that work or those cells within the GI tract. Those are all then hormones related to nutrition 
which you have to keep in mind to understand what this paper is going to talk about. The secretion of those hormones is stimulated by nutrients, of course, within the intestine, and then act on their respective receptors, either centrally, locally, or via the vagal afferent directly to the brain. They are in close proximity to so-called enteroendocrine cells, the, the vagal afferents, and they regulate metabolic homeostasis through various changes in food intake, gas, gastric emptying, so you empty the stomach, you can get hungry again, intestinal motility, moving the food through the digestive system, and or energy expenditure such as muscle activity, including, of course, the tonic heart. Perhaps nutrient-induced gut-derived hormones activate local gut signaling events to trigger the CNS via the vagus nerve to regulate glucose homeostasis. This is pretty much being considered as a paradigm in our understanding of molecular nutrition. So that leads me to be able to talk about glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1. So let's go through this again. I'm sorry it's fast, but we need to get to the actual bare bones, the anatomy of this paper. In order to do that, we have to define what we're discussing. I'm a biochemist, and I'm also a um, always becoming philosopher, and both biochemists and philosophers always define our terms. That's what I'm doing here. So GLP-1. GLP-1 is synthesized in intestinal endocrine cells in two principal major molecular forms, type 1 and type 2. See there? So that's a protein that's uh, proteolytically degraded to two different uh, uh, polypeptides, and each of those have differing activity. GLP-1 secretion is by ileal L cells. It depends on the presence of nutrients in the lumen of the small intestine. Peptide was first identified following the cloning of cDNAs and genes for proglucagon in the early 1980s. It's one of the two principal so-called incretin hormones, along with things like uh, CCK and other, and other hormones we just talked about. GLP-1 it has a multiple physiological effect and makes an attractive candidate for type 2 diabetic therapy because it seems to regulate the, all those activities of digestion, which are linked, of course, to diabetes. It increases, for example, insulin secretion while inhibiting glucagon release. Hence, it's very uh, germane to our discussion today. But only when glucose levels are elevated. Thus, it offers the potential to lower plasma glucose while reducing the likelihood of hypoglycemia. Because that's what happens when you get a lot of insulin induction. Insulin removes glucose from the blood. So if you get an overall enhancement of insulin secretion and you don't um, slow that down via feedback inhibition, what you can get is hypoglycemic. And of course, that can cause coma and stroke. Not a good thing. People who are type 1 diabetics know all about this. Gastric emptying is delayed and food intake is decreased after GLP-1 administra uh, administration. This is good. The longer the stomach stays full, the less a person wants to eat. And that's all part of what's occurring in the central nervous system. Some of the signaling that goes on directly to the brain, to the reward pathway, actually. All right. Gastric emptying is delayed, as I said. In a six-week study investigating continuous GLP-1 infusion patients, this is a human study, with type 2 diabetes, achieved a significant weight loss of 1.9 kilograms. That's pretty good. That's about, well, I don't know what, four pounds. And a reduction in appetite from baseline compared with patients that just got a placebo peptide. Okay? Uh, and there was no significant change in weight or appetite, however, okay, well, from the placebo. Preclinical studies reveal other potential benefits of GLP-1 receptor agonist treatment in individuals with type 2 diabetes, T2D, call it. That includes a promotion of beta cell proliferation when you get the insulin from insulin secretion from, and a reduced beta cell apoptosis, which means the beta cells don't turn over and die because of programmed cell death. That's all good. That means you have a high level of insulin sensitivity, which is what's lost in type 2 diabetes, as you might know, as if you're a, a physician, medical doctor, researcher, uh, or a graduate student in biochemistry or veterinary science, for example, or even neuroscience. The preclinical results indicate that GLP-1 could be beneficial in treating patients with type 2 diabetes. So that's, that's one of the arguments, okay? However, because native GLP-1 is rapidly inactivated and degraded by that enzyme we talked about, that peptidase, TPP-4, and now we have inhibitors of that enzyme, as you know, and it has a very short half-life anyway of about one and a half minutes to achieve clinical potential for native GLP-1 patients where they require a 24-hour administration of the native protein. And that is usually a problem <clears throat> because you need a constant infusion of it. And because it turns over so quickly, is that really going to be a good target for the pharmaceutical companies? Well, it depends on how it's targeted, right? 
Now, a couple of other things to keep in mind. In the fasting liver, SIRT1, which is a deacetylase, histone deacetylase, controlling pathways that are responsible for the upregulation of gluconeogenesis. In the early stages of fasting, gluconeogenesis is turned on by the Krebs CRTCT pathway. Those are transcription factors, which I will elaborate soon. Those also activate SIRT1 transcription. However, SIRT1 activation triggers deacetylation, because that's what it is. It's a deacetylase uh, and subsequent ubiquitination and degradation of one of the proteins involved in its expression, SIRT-C2. That overall then lowers the expression of the Krebs target. This is your fashionable feedback inhibition pathway at the molecular endocrine level. At the same time, SIRT1 deacetylates, because that's what the enzyme does, and thus activates PGC1-alpha and FOXO transcription factors to turn on the genes for necessary for response of long-term fasting. So it does a lot of stuff early to turn on the expression of other genes. Then that initial foray into transcriptional regulation, which gives you new transcription factors, is then stopped, feedback inhibited, Good thing, right? Because you don't want a constant expression of something that itself is transcriptional regulator. That shuts down. But then you've got these transcription factors which go on to take care of long-term fasting. One of the ways it's going to do be utilizing fatty acids and also conducting gluconeogenesis in the hepatic tissue. You also have the formation of ketone bodies, which is triggered at the same time because the ketogenesis pathway is turned on. All good during fasting. So CERT1 is the most studied of all of these deacetylases. It influences the differentiation of preadipocytes by repressing peroxyproliferative activated receptor gamma. Additionally, it deacetylates and thus activates the PGC1 alpha, which is the, one of the components of today's talk, which in turn can activate mitochondrial biogenesis, remember that, as well as induce endothelial nitric acid synthase expression. I've already mentioned this. Activation of certain one also causes deacetylation and activation of the PPAR alpha that is peroxyproliferative activated receptor alpha. That's a different isoform. That turns on genes, PBR alpha, turns on genes for beta oxidation of fatty acids. I know you love these Greek letters, right? In summary, these changes activate oxidative metabolism in the muscle, skeletal muscle, I mean, fat cells, adipose depot fat, and in the liver to improve insulin sensitivity and prevent progression of metabolic aged disorders. So this is all a good understanding. We have a good understanding of how these transcription factors and these epigenetic profiling with CERT1, which is, which is of course a, uh, it is a CERT1 is a deacetylase. So when you deacetylate something, you're directly writing into the epigenetic pathways. So epigenetic pathways involve sensing, involves writing, involves reading and involves erasure, none of which alters the genome. That's why it's called epigenetics. It's a wonderful way to control the activity of cells and living systems. I'm not going to go through all these individual pathways here. Certain one has been discussed in Alzheimer's disease. I went through this in previous talks. And part of this is uh, Alzheimer's disease. There's an A-beta protein, for example. Um, it, it involves ERK pathways, synaptic plasticity, circadian rhythms, right? Circadian clock. It protects against, certain one protects against Parkinson's disease by controlling the HSF1 expression and therefore the HAC protein 70. Uh, as I said, it blocks the uh, A beta protein, which of course has been linked to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it involves central metabolism, the uh, target of rapamycin uh, complex one, as well as controlling CREB. And we already talked about CREB, and CREB is actually controlled by an interfering RNA, MIR-134 which is also regulated by this deacetylase. There's a lot of things going on here. Right? They all come together, of course, but I'm not going to ask you to remember all that today, but they do all come together. All right, now, here's a paper called from Science Signaling about, um, well, now two years ago, January 31st of 2017. Dysregulation of mitochondrial biogenesis and function corrupts ATP synthesis, as you might guess, because that's the bulk of ATP synthesis. It also can increase reactive oxygen species, modify calcium signaling, and misdirect fatty acid oxidation, amino acid metabolism, including oxidation, urea genesis, 
the TCA cycle itself, ketogenesis, as controlled by AMP kinase. So this is a really bad thing. When you dysregulate mitochondrial biogenesis, you get all of these downstream effects, which terribly destroy cellular function and can lead, uh, um, among all these other metabolic disarrays, can actually lead to inflammatory responses because you start to generate inflammatory signalings via the production of cytokines, particularly in cells like endothelial cells. AMP kinase is involved in energy homeostasis. AMP kinase regulation is linked into activated by canonical phosphorylation signal transduction cascades. Both the liver kinase B, LKBB, LKB1, and calcium chymogen dependent protein kinase B, or CAM KK beta, activate AMP kinase. Uh, an intermediate nucleotide metabolism called ACAR, I won't bother going through the title, uh, metformin, the, the diabetic drug, and pulsatile shear stress all activate AMP kinase. Phosphoamp kinase phosphorylates all the downstream signaling cascade. That's easy to remember. You phosphorylate the AMP kinase, it hit phosphorylates its uh, targets. It's a major contributor of mitochondrial biogenesis, AMP kinase is, and bioenergetic competence. Not only do you make more mitochondria, they are competent to be mitochondria. And that's because you phosphorylate peroxidome proliferative activator receptor gamma coactivator 1 alpha, the one that we're really interested in here today, that we're uh, affectionately known as PGC1 alpha. PGC1-alpha is the key transcription factor. Then in mitochondrial biogenesis, phospho-PGC1-alpha induces transcription of nuclear respiratory factors 1 and 2, the NERFs. NERF can increase the transcription of the ultimate transcription factor A, TFAM, which induces the transcription of the mitochondrial genome, vital for the mitochondria to be functioning. So there's a synergistic coactivation of PPAR delta by PGC1-alpha and AMP kinase that enhances lipid utilization as beta oxidation and, of course, exercise performance that we saw a few slides back. Okay, so you get increased in capillary density. You get an increase in lipid metabolic pathways. Um, there's no change in exercise performance by this homeostatic control. Once you induce the PGC1-alpha AMP kinase along with these other co-transcriptional factors, you increase exercise performance, and this is linked again to the production of PGC1-alpha along with AMP kinase activation, because what that does is increase mitochondrial content, and of course, that's going to give you a direct effect on, on exercise performance. The more your mitochondria, the better the exercise, okay? So that's basically what's written down here. I didn't need to really write it and discuss it, but it's there for you to go back to and analyze it as you will. Now, acute hypoxic preconditioning prevents palmitic acid-induced cardiomyocyte apoptosis via switching metabolic GLUT4 glucose pathway back to a fatty acid-dependent pathway. This is another thing also to keep in mind what's going on. That's because you want to utilize fatty acids. I'll check this out. CERT1 is itself a substrate for AMP kinase. You phosphorylate it. It is going to deacetylate PGC1-alpha. PGC1-alpha is now active because you got rid of the acetate. It's, gonna, it's going to combine with a retinoic acid receptor module, or RXR, in the nucleus, and it's going to cause the expression of CD36, which is going to allow the influx of fatty acids from the serum from lipoproteins. This is all good stuff in terms of ameliorating a lot of the dyslipidemia associated with type 2 diabetes and obesity in general, and even aging in general. CD36 expression increases influx serum of fatty acids as biofuel. That, of course, is going to require, then, concomitant mitochondrial activity, and that's going to mean all the beta oxidation genes are set up, which is going to involve the synthesis or expression of CPT currency per mineral transfers 1 beta, which is also induced by this PPAR uh, RXR pathway. This is all wonderful, right? Of course it is. All right. Now, some metabolism for those of you that have been missing it so far on the talk. Fatty acids are used to make acetyl-CoA. Glucose can make acetyl-CoA. Amino acids can make acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA can enter the TCA cycle where it's respired off indirectly because of the OAA carbon is lost. To carbon dioxide, eight electrons are generated and one GTP, which is just like an ATP, only it's a different purine, right? The electrons enter into oxidative phosphorylation electron transport chain. Oxygen is, of course, reduced to water. Phosphate is added to ADP. So this is oxidative phosphorylation linked to ETC. 
It's because of a proton gradient generated because of the oxidation of NADH, which was also generated in TCA cycle. I just went over this recently. Sorry, I'm going fast, but I think a lot of you know it. If you don't, it's not important that you know all the detail. Again, I, I don't like to leave things out in my talks. Same with my lectures at university halls. So again, the canonical pathway, pyruvate to acetylcholine, this is an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase. Very complex enzyme, very nicely regulated. I talked about it recently, not talking about today. You lose, it's decarboxylating, you lose some electrons because you make some NADH. Acetylcholine is the TCA cycle we just had. This is the pyruvate dehydrogenase pathway. Again, I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, I will mention that there is a lipid component, that's the hydrolipoleal transacetylase is involved there. That could be linked uh, to this overall talk, but I left it out because I knew it would add another five minutes. So this is just pyruvate dehydrogenase. The product that we're interested in today, part of it is an ADH. It's going to be used to be reoxidized to make uh, ATP ultimately because the proton transport chain in the inner mitochondrial membrane, uh, chemiosmosis, uh, proton pumping ATPase in complex five and all that I've talked about many times. But the other major product is acetyl-CoA. Once you make acetyl-CoA, again, TCA cycles turned on, electron transport chain, ATP. Here is the TCA cycle. The reason I'm showing it to you, not because I love metabolic pathways, but I, of course I do, because I'm a biochemist. And even though this isn't fatty acid synthesis or fatty acid oxidation or sphingolipid metabolism, which is the coolest, it is all linked to all of those lipid pathways. In fact, it serves those lipid pathways. So it's basically, basically just nothing. CCA cycle is nothing more than a servant to lipo, lipid homeostasis, as everyone knows. Now, the important reaction here, uh, and that was only partially tongue in cheek, because actually that's true, um, is that oxaloacetic acid and acetyl CoA combine to make citrate. And the enzyme that does that is citrate synthase. That's the first frank enzyme in the TCA pathway. Once you make citrate, you start pushing the cycle. You push the cycle, you make NADH, you make NADH, you can reoxidize it in the electron transport chain. And then finally, you can reduce oxygen to water. You can pump those protons. You can make ATP through the F0, F1 proton pumping ATPase, as we've been saying. All right. Another way of looking at it, um, acetyl-CoA, of course, and OAA makes citrate. If citrate, if you're in anabolic mode, can make fatty acids and steroidogenesis in the cytosol, citrate leaves the mitochondria. But when you make alpha ketoglutarate running through the TCA cycle, that can be utilized via transamination reactions, which is amino transferases, but I like the word transam because it makes me think of one of my favorite cars. And that's for amino acid synthesis. And amino acids, of course, are used to make neurotransmitters, of course, proteins. Um, if you carry on the TCA cycle, you make succ-CoA, succinyl-CoA is the direct precursor of the heme biosynthesis. This is showing you the fantastic nature of the TCA cycle, not just for fatty acids, although these are just all sort of also supporting it. Um, all right, succinyl-CoA makes malate. A couple steps later, malate can be used directly for gluconeogenesis, and OAA also can, and once it's made in the cytosol, but OAA directly, again, transamination reactions, for example, directly to aspartic acid. Once you aminate OAA, you make aspartate. So you can see the TCA cycle is really important here. All right. Now, one more thing to keep in mind that we're going to get back to this paper. I know we're moving quickly, but we've got to move quickly. All right. You can also make oxaloacetic acid from pyruvate. So you can decarboxylate it via the PDH to make acetyl-CoA. But at the same time, pyruvate cuts another way in the mitochondria. Pyruvate carboxylates, that's adds, right, uh, uh, carbon and you actually add, make oxaloacetic acid. And in fact, acetyl-CoA, which is also generated with PDH, stimulates the PC enzyme so that you have equal molar amounts of OAA and acetyl-CoA to make citrates. There's citrate synthase right there. You go through an intermediate called citril-CoA. The thioester actually drives this reaction to make citrate. Okay, enough of that. Now, back to PGC1-alpha. It's a transcription factor involved in energy metabolism. It co-regulates gene expression by interacting with PPAR gamma thus deploying a suite of downstream transcription factors, which we've been seeing in those cartoons in my verb, verbiage, my narrative, which are all associated with mitochondrial expansion, as well as co-regulating the cyclic AMP response element binding protein. I told you I would tell you what CREB was, and the nuclear respiratory factors of the nerves. I don't really like saying nerf, I won't say it anymore. The NRFs. P not because I don't like nerf balls, because I don't like the nerf cartoon. Strange, I know. PGC1-alpha acts as an axial bridge. These are my terms, okay? Between external physiological stimuli 
and the regulation of mitochondrial biogenesis, thereby stimulating, now dig this, red muscle fiber production. What are red muscle fibers? Nothing more than muscle fibers with a lot of mitochondria. Iron content, red color, get it? Yes. All right, this is another one of my favorite slides. PGC1-alpha also works downstream, inducing hepatic gluconeogenesis. Remember, I told you that was going to happen. Fasting, glucagon production, glucocorticoids, which is a steroid hormone, or the production of cyclic AMP. Turn on protein kinase A, protein kinase A, phosphorylates Kreb. When that happens, the CBPP300 and Kreb bind to the uh, CR, that's the response element, that's DNA. It causes the transcription of PGC1-alpha. PGC1-alpha goes through, go into this wonderful complex here with uh, GR, this is a, a hormone receptor, uh, PPAR-alpha, along with AF2-IRU. Those are the DNA units and binding to the cis elements. The transcription elements are trans-activating. FOXO is there, of course, HNF4-alpha there, and there is PGC1-alpha on the other side. So you see it forms trimers on either side of the DNA. Uh, once that happens, look what gets expressed, pepcarboxykinase and glucose phosphatase. Those are gluconeogenic, hepatic gluconeogenic enzymes because you don't have the phosphatase, of course, in the muscles or anywhere else really in the body. So this is gluconeogenic, 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 all regulated by PGC1-alpha. Now, if you phosphorylate that with an insulin-dependent AKT enzyme, boom, it's gone, no longer active. If you deacetylate PGC1-alpha that we already told you, it makes it functional. So you need to deacetylate the resting state, and that acetylation is caused by, yep, N-acetyltransferases, GCN5, that acetylates and therefore inhibits PGC1-alpha. So you got to use the CERT1, CERT1 is required. That is an epigenetic phenomenon. I told you, epigenetics is all over metabolism. It's just often not talked about because it scares stop biochemistry students, and it totally baffles a lot of other people who can go unmentioned. So there's a one more aspect I want you to keep in mind. In the mouse, okay, this hasn't been worked out that well yet in human studies, but it, it has at least been found. Murine microRNA regular transcription of pgc one alpha promotes brown adipose tissue. Isn't that cool? Okay, it causes this beijing or browning of white adipose tissue, okay, to brown. Why is that important? You get more, more mitochondria, more mitochondria, more heat production, more basal energy loss, better to keep down obesity. All right, how all this is regulated? Oh man, it's all regulated because you have this functioning of PGC1-alpha. In order to get that, for example, cold stress can do this in, in animal models. So that's how they lay on a brown fat layer when you're a mouse. We don't have nearly as much, unfortunate perhaps, but there's a good reason for that. Metabolically, evolutionarily, and via endocrine, which I got into in some other talk probably a year ago. I'm not going to discuss it now. But anyways, Within brown fat, you make this interfering RNA. It blocks this TOB1, which then blocks the P38 phosphorylation. If you block that, you allow for the phosphorylation of ATF. Phosphorylation of ATF then allows for the transcription of FGF and UCP and PGC1-alpha. We talked about these already. These are all involved then ultimately in making mitochondria, okay? Um, stimulating serum FGF is the, is the factor uh, that's necessary for that Beijing in the mouse model. So see, that's just cool. It's one other thing PGC1-alpha does. I want you to keep it in mind for the diabetological inclusion. PGC1-alpha drives a metabolic block on prostate cancer progression. What's this? This is a paper I published, uh, uh, not I published that was published in Nature Cell Biology three years ago. Here we got, uh, as PGC1-alpha levels are high, you get a lot of glucose going to the TCA cycle, right? You get glucose oxidation. You get a lot of fatty acid oxidation. You get a lot of electron transport. You get a lot of, a lot of branch chain amino acid utilization of TCA cycle. Really important for reestablishing homeostasis. Now, as you increase the amount of estrogen-related receptor alpha, which is a bad player in prostate cancer, prostate cancer progression, it's getting bigger, see? You switch from this model to making, yeah, pyruvate and lactate, but you slow down the TCA cycle. You don't get beta oxidation. Rather, citrate is synthesized, but it leaves the mitochondria, goes through the isocitrate lyase reaction, making cytosolic acetyl-CoA and OAA, 
that's really a bad thing because acetylcholine then goes on to make fatty acids. So this is what happens in cancer cells in the tumor that's associated with prostate cancer. And so once you get genoma for lipogenesis, of course, you can get then new blood vessel formation because you need lipids for a new membrane. And when that happens, that's all really bad because it helps the tumor grow. So paradoxically, this is all what's happening. Paradoxically, though, that's why it's in red. Sorry, this is in red too because that's a paradox of this normal healthy pathway. Not a paradox, it's just an outflow. Here's the paradox. Follow the arrow. Paradoxically, although PTC1 alpha may prevent aggressive cancers like prostate cancer, pharmacotherapeutic treatments may be inhibited by elevating its activity plus or minus its expression by inadvertently removing tumor associated loss accumulation, reactive oxygen. You kick up a lot of mitochondrial dust, you're going to get a lot of reactive oxygen that kills tumor cells. And a lot of chemotherapeutics, traditional ones, actually want to elevate the amount of reactive oxygen in the core of the tumor or even in the medulla around the tumor itself, right? And so if you're, if you're altering that pathway by upping PGC1-alpha, it can actually corrupt all that chemotherapy that was designed to kill the prostate cancer. Be careful. That's all I'm saying. Finally, BBRC paper results. Agonist peptide, that's the, 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 uh, the compound we're looking at, induces PGC1-alpha downstream. It's the Lixi peptide. The transcription factors of mitochondrial biogenesis. That's what this paper shows. Here's PGC1-alpha messenger RNA levels. It's increased because you increase the amount of Lixi senatide. Increase more, get more expression. I love the way they use these bizarre things with the, the, the dollar sign. These must have been people associated with big pharma. Oh, I'm kidding. I don't know, but I didn't put those in there. That's what was there. Uh, it's just a Western blot showing you get more as you increase the amount of the drug. Beta acting doesn't change at all. Here's just a protein level, taking the Western blot and digitizing it and giving you quantitative analysis. If you make more of it, statistically significant. Uh, error bar is pretty tight. Um, messenger RNA levels of NRF and TFAM, remember, are required for the biogenesis of mitochondria. They go way up when you add Lixia at 20 nanomolar. Uh, and likewise, here's the Western blot of the protein. That's RNA. Transcription is the protein. More NRF1, more TFAM, these transcription factors of mitochondria biogenesis. Indeed, the proteins go jack way up again, statistically significant. Second set of data, Lixisintamide enhances mitochondrial expansion and biochemical energetics. So you get an oxygen concentration effect here, right? So the vehicle itself, this is what happens over time in terms of oxygen utilization. Remember in, in oxyphosphorylation is oxygen uptake. So these should be going down. It increases the amount of respiration that is production of oxygen to water. One of the things also production of CO2, not from oxygen from the atmosphere, of course, but from the decarboxylation reactions. Uh, anyway, uh, you notice here, notice you notice here that Lixi enhances respiration. And indeed, the oxygen flow is increased with Lixi, right? And the ATP levels are increased, which you would expect. More oxygen utilization, more ATP synthesis. You know, the P-naught ratio is not that. All right, <clears throat> so just showing you the mitochondrial DNA increases. It's a ratio of mitochondrial to nuclear DNA. So preferentially increase the amount of mitochondrial DNA. Groovy, you want more mitochondrial DNA because you want to make more mitochondria. You want to get them to go through fission and then make more mitochondria per cell. So you should see higher levels of DNA to mitochondria relative to the nuclear, which doesn't change. Same thing here. The DAPI just stains for uh, the nucleus DNA. The mito tracker shows you lixisentamide, centide, lixisenatide makes more mitochondria, makes more DNA. And when you merge the two and you overlap those two staining techniques, you see that indeed there's more mitochondria and there's more DNA. And that's what's showing you here. Mitochondrial mass is also increased when you add Lixi. Down here, cytochrome B is increased. This is a gene that's expressed from the mitochondrial genome. Bump, goes up, right, at the protein level. And citrate synthase, another really important enzyme, is also upchucked, uh, upticked, excuse me, <laughs> by adding Lixi. All good. Here's citrate synthase, by the way. Remember that? First enzyme in the TCA cycle. Yep, that's why I went through that. Uh, just showing you what, what we already talked about, ATP levels, then we already said that. More data. p Kreb goes up in expression when you la add lixisenatide. Beta action doesn't change. As you add lixisenatide from 0 to 20, it increases incrementally. All statistically significant and very cool. And that's a protein level. This is showing you the Western blot. If you get an inhibitor, H89 is an inhibitor of 
cyclic AMP CREB, right, that binds to that transcription site, uh, to the CRE element, uh, intoxicates the PGC1 alpha effect. Indeed, you get less P CREB, boom. See, when you add that drug, no good. See, you inhibit it. Same thing here. You add Lixi and then you add the inhibitor. You get rid of PGC1 alpha. You get rid of the NERF1. You get rid of NRF1, excuse me. You get rid of TFAM, no effect on beta, uh, beta actin, which shouldn't be affected. That's the uh, negative control should not be altered by the uh, addition of these pharmaceuticals. Uh, shown here the same way. You add Lixi, you increase from the background, from, from the control. You increase from the control, but you knock it back down when you add the inhibitor of the uh, cyclic AMP CREB activity. And this is, again, mitochondrial DNA to DNA, nuclear DNA fraction also changed. So you know where it's happening. Here's the proximal discussion. Lixi senatide is a GLP-1 R agonist. GLP-1-R is a seven transmembrane protein receptor for the glucagon-like peptide one, again, the gut hormone. It stimulates glucose-induced insulin secretion. We already went through how it does that. Upon binding the ligand, the receptor is endocytose. This is a feedback regulatory mechanism, thus controlling insulin secretion once glucose levels decrease. So it's glucose-dependent activation of insulin secretion, which is what you want. You don't want this thing active. You don't want more insulin when there's not any glucose around. So GLP-1R mutations or splice variations are linked with type 2 diabetes. We know this. Uh, data shown here in this paper suggests that lixisenatide stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis in human endothelial cells. That's what was done. They're using hex cells as endothelial cells. <coughs> Trigger mechanisms seem to be lixisenatide promoted the expression of PGC1-alpha, which in turn activated NRF1 and TFAM, promoting mitochondrial copy number, right, via fission, Increases per cell, which results in increases in cytochrome B expression, citrate synthase activity, which was linked to a treatment, led to which was linked to treatment, and that led to augmentation of mitochondrial respiratory activity and ATP production. The evidence was supported by using the inhibitor of the canonical pathway, working through the cyclic AMP, CREB, PGC1 alpha, NRF1, TFAM, transcriptional activation sequence of events, which was the last slide I showed you. Here is the diaventologics. Since cardiovascular disease, the global problem, one of the major killers, if not the major killer, and cancer, the second major killer of all human beings, uh, are linked to mitochondrial dysfunction, leading to fibrosis in the heart, for example, and also in the uh, endothelium, right, in the bloodstream, inflammation, another bad player, and cell, pro especially autoinflammation, and cell proliferation, such as in oncogenesis, an enhancement of mitochondrial biogenesis could increase survival of healthy tissue while delivering a blow to insulin insensitivity, that's your metabolic disease, and the autoinflammation which is associated with production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are linked to obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. Enhancing that transcriptome, thus elevating mitochondrial activity should promote fatty acid oxidation. Uh, sorry, not amino uh, acid utilization. It should be amino. Sorry for that misspelling. What a drag. And it should also enhance bioenergetics, right, ATP production, while decreasing cellular metabolism linked to aberrant gene expression and ROS production. You should do both things. To keep that thing humming along, you should be able to control ROS production. However, if tumor core oxidative phosphorylation is increased, cell proliferation can be expected because you're getting more bioenergetics, this could serve to enhance tumor growth, even proliferation, dyslipidemia, okay, because overall it's what's occurring, right? Because uh, you can then start making fatty acids, remember that pathway. Because uh, citrate synthase also will allow for citrate utilization and removal of the cytosol, thus making yes, becoming uh, leukogenic. And of course, ultimately metastasis, the worst part of cancer, especially during conventional chemotherapy that relies on ROS accumulation in situ. So remember, this is a big caveat, it's a big problem that I found from papers published a few years back, which I've now synthesized into the network of this paper. This isn't part of this paper. This is my analysis using diavent ontology, my new paradigm. However, um, okay, we already went through this. Therefore, while metabolic diseases may benefit from PGC1-alpha hyperexpression, upticking it, for example, with Lixi, Long-term altered metabolic homeostasis can tip toward an oncogenic pathway. Who knows where the tipping point is and what cell, what mass, what time, all those other things. Age, specific individual gene expression, right, in terms of epigenetics even. The precise timing, therefore, and specification of spatial distribution, the dialectic, that is, 
all A is B, no A is B, right? Dialectic, then some A is B, right? The synthesis of PGC1 alpha expression, cardio, which includes cardiovascular versus skeletal muscle. This is where the gene can be expressed. Skeletal muscle versus the liver versus the adipose is an event driven, okay? Time and event that occurs at a specific place and location. And the outcome becomes unevenly distributed thereby potentially changing the cellular dynamics of the system. And that then becomes the new truth of the ontologics, right? What is there now, right? The, onto the ontologics. Finally, because we brought it up at the beginning, I'm bringing it up at the end. And it's part of my dia event ontologies. Epigenetic phenomena such as interfering RNA, we already know is involved. Methylation and acetylation is already involved. The enzymes that counter distribute erasure pathways, those are the demethylases, deacetylases, etc., could be indiscriminately confounded. That is, we don't really know in what way they're going to be confounded when you uptick PGC1 alpha. That requires complex molecular network assessment in the drugged individual that's got, for example, Lixi, where you're trying to increase the amount of mitochondrial biogenesis. You need to look at the whole complex molecular network. We only looked at a sliver of it in this paper. But I alluded to it in those all pre, those pre forma slides and individual medical surveillance. That is the outcome, not just doing all this molecular work, but the outcome. What happens to cardiovascular disease? What, what happens to the amount of adipose tissue? What happens to tonicity of the heart? What happens to the size of the tumor, et cetera? Followed by directed countermeasures and reevaluation in real time. All of this then involves a much more complicated derivative medical intervention that has to work on the individual level. That's why we need to know a lot more. And we have to now start concentrating our research and looking at the whole picture every time we look at the delivery of a new drug or a new therapy or a new surgery or a new lifestyle change or a new diet or just the effects of aging or injury or stress or even uh, psychological profile. And we need to design experiments to look at that at the molecular level, at the grainy level, right? If we do that, we'll be able to look at the real impact of what we're doing. We'll be able to work out from that center and be able to generate in science, particularly in medical sciences, which is what I'm talking about here, but in any science, a dia, that dialectical event ontological perspective on health and pathophysiology. Thanks a lot for your attention. I think we made it in time. Uh, that's me as well. There's my Facebook page. It's Vera Med is what we are. The email address for Vera Med is shown there. There's our website. Come visit it. There's my individual email address. I give it out even though some people suggest I, I'm doing something that could hurt me. I'm still doing it. Contact me via my direct email site, and I will um, interact with you on all the things you've heard in any of my talks that are free on YouTube my very bad lectures, as well as uh, taking you on as a potential client, okay, which was, is much more interesting, even though this, I'm sure, is quite fascinating. All right, these glasses are starting to bother me. So with that, I'm going to end my talk. And I'm going to say, like I always do, um, close this up. Um, hope you have a great uh, rest of the day. And... Um, <clears throat> 